Good evening, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute. And I can say on behalf of the whole team, we're really, really happy to have you here for this event on, if I can find the right page of my notes, Fresh Perspectives, a guide to your career in public service and international affairs. It's really great to have you here. And just a, a quick note for uh, Sarah Burke, my colleague, and, and uh, Evie. McCullough and indeed John and Tom from the house staff for, for putting on such a good show. Uh, this was Sarah and Evie's brainchild. This, we've spoken about it for a long time to try and do a student event, so it's really great that it's actually that it's kicking off. We have a great panel here of four people, which I'm going to who, who I will introduce in a moment, and they're going to speak for between five and ten minutes. If it's any longer than ten minutes, Sarah will start switching the lights on and off. <laughs> but I just wanted to say just a, a quick note. This is a great opportunity for us as an institute. Um, to talk to you at, at this stage in your lives. My own career, I had a, the chance to think about it a little bit when preparing for this event. And I, I worked in politics, I worked in the Dáil and the European Parliament and in Westminster. And I worked as an academic, so I worked in universities in the UK, in Europe, in the EU, in, in, in the US. Um, and I worked in think tanks in, in London and in Brussels and in Berlin. And it's all, it was really cool. I've, I've had a really nice career, but I remember as a student being really anxious about like the next move and the right move. And I, I was, I'm sure you guys are having similar conversations with yourself and with your peers that like, I, I wish I was able to tell myself back then that it didn't really matter because people change jobs a lot. I change jobs frequently and I'm sure many of you will as well. So if you're anxious or stressed, I guess I encourage you not to. But what I, what I realized was that for me, I had like a handful of conversations over the past 20 years that mattered. So call them mentors or call them colleagues, but like it was literally moments where I met someone and I'm thinking, what you're doing is really cool, or someone who was very supportive and helped you decide the next thing and to open the next door. So I guess this is a part of that conversation now. I'm really happy that we're having it with these four interesting people. We're gonna first of all hear from Amy Stapleton, who I just heard comes from very close to where I'm from <laughs> in the southeast of Ireland. So Amy is a, is a policy officer at the Migration Network Ireland uh, with our colleagues in the ESRI, the Economic Social Research Institute. Uh, after Amy, we're going to hear from Anya Early. Thanks for being with us, Anya. Anya is an administrative officer in the Irish Department of Finance. So uh, thanks for all the public services and for the exchequer spending. <laughs> thirdly, <laughs> thirdly, we're going to call. We're going to hear from Kevin Culligan, uh, who's a desk officer in the International Security Policy Unit, EU Common Security and Defence Policy Political Division at the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. A bit of a mouthful. Did I get it right? Yeah. Any adjectives incorrect? <laughs> and then finally, we're going to hear from, I can still say our own Luke O'Callaghan White, because Luke is now Programme Manager for uh, Climate, Energy and Sustainability at Friends of Europe Brussels, but um, Friends of Europe in Brussels, rather. But Luke was recently of this parish, so Luke uh, worked with our team until, until Christmas, and we were sad to see him go, but delighted to have him back. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our panel. You're going to each speak for, like I said, five to ten minutes or so. I'll flap around my arms if it's gone for too long, but... <laughs> Amy, over to you if you'd like to kick off. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I very much remember being in your shoes, so um, hopefully something I say is going to be interesting for you. And ask loads of questions, please. Um, so uh, Sarah mentioned um, to kind of say, tell us this is story of the career, my career so far, which I think is going to take plenty more turns yet. Um, so, But basically when I was in school, which is probably before a lot of you are now, um, I was really interested in social justice and human rights issues, and it was something that was really played on my mind and worried me how would I kind of work in something like that I had no idea even how where to start I did lots of volunteering and things but I didn't know where to start so I ended up doing applying for a program mainly because I saw there was a work placement outside of Europe um, but it was also called international development and food policy down in Cork um, and it was very interesting undergrad which um, you covered lots of different areas policy areas including advocacy education human rights um, all of everything to do with health, um, so it was very broad. Um, unfortunately, when I when I was kind of going through it, I was like, oh, the broader it is, the less I know what I want to do. Um, so I did my work placement. I was lucky to go over to Kenya, and I worked as a um, kind of a liaison officer between the funding organisation down in Cork and the organisations uh, the the organisations we were working at on the ground in Kenya, in Nairobi, and in the north of Kenya. And what I realised there, and I suppose it was kind of a kind of key turning point, even though I didn't realise at the time, was that I realised that a lot of organisations going into places like Kenya were coming from a very Western-centric perspective. And 
what I really wanted to do was work with people who are in the situations that we were trying to fund, um, fund projects for, I was trying to work with them to, they knew the best, they were the experts, and that was really kind of the start. So working on kind of peer-led research, working on peer-led projects, people who are from an area, supporting them to do what they do best and what they know best. So that's kind of, after my, my undergrad, I ended up, um, I didn't have financial support for my master's, so I needed funding which is not always easy to find. So I would recommend looking at Erasmus Mundus programs, not that I'm um, doing a big you know, hurrah for them, but uh, they are great because they fund you. And um, again, I saw there was travel involved, but it was called intercultural mediation. And the mediation really ticked a box for me because I wanted to work between people. Originally, I thought there was kind of a more legal basis, um, but it was actually very different to what I thought it would be, which was a positive and a, and a negative at the time. I was like, oh, genie, what am I after getting into? Um, so intercultural mediation was focused on migration and the great thing about it was that you could travel. So again, I spent every semester over two years was in a different country. So I was in France, um, Romania, Senegal and then back to France. And it was a bilingual studies and I very much thought my French was much better than it was and went over with leaving Sir French, um, not higher level, and um, found myself studying political philosophy and migration studies with very little French and doing graphs and all the things that I shouldn't do in a philosophy essay. Um, passed the course, and but one thing I think was key for me during it, um, and it takes a lot of work, but it was the volunteering aspect of internships, and that's one thing. Just build. I wasn't building my CV as I thought about it at the time, but getting the experience was key. Just meeting people, meeting organisations. I worked with a lot of NGOs in Senegal. I got to work with the United Nations or Office for Drugs and Crime. Just things landed on my lap, and I could t take part. Um, after that I was wrecked, so I spent two years travelling and I was absolutely exhausted, so I stayed in Lille, um, where, where the Masters was based, and began lecturing um, in the university that the Masters was on, on things like intercultural um, communication, migration studies, English language, um, and all the kind of very random mix of things, but that all kind of fit together. Um, lecturing I was very interested in, but it wasn't taking that for me, it was always there's a passion drive behind that was there was something there, you know. So, um, and I think it's an interesting thing to think about when you're a student. We set up during the master's program, we set up an organization, a student organization, that was mainly set up for supporting students as we traveled around the different countries. But it ended up ended up being because we were in northern France at the time of the jungle, if you know about it, and Calais, and there was a lot of uh, makeshift camps and evictions and. A lot of young migrants and asylum seekers found themselves on the street. We ended up completely moving to a support role and we actually had a lot of projects that were run by migrant groups for the local community and vice versa. So um, that was something key for me. So I started really working on the ground and we worked with a lot of policymakers and um, local government to try and, for example, find housing for young people, young migrants who had nowhere to live. So when we were doing this, that was all great, but I found that it was constantly one step forward, two steps back. So we were getting somewhere, and then there was more people arriving, the government would change their policies, and things would shift. So I said, what am I going to do? And I started thinking about it. Then I was slowly getting, now I'd been in, our, in France for about, and traveling for quite a number of years, and I was getting the, the, the call home, you know? You start to kind of go, okay, at some point I want to kind of move back towards home, I miss my family a bit. Um, and I started a PhD. So I started a PhD, which is ongoing and will finish soon. Um, but uh, the PhD basically worked with the people in France um, and the PhD has shifted completely from what I planned it to be. It was supposed to be comparative and that was a terrible idea and it's now just focused on France. Um, but basically it's, it's finally moving towards supporting the young people again, get involved in the policy decisions and they've actually been co-researchers in the study. And one of the things that we had, I kind of skipped over, but um, while I was in that organisation in France and while we ran that student organisation, we linked up with different policymakers at the local level, national level, but also we started to link up with the Council of Europe. And that's somewhere I think if you're any way interested in, in kind of European affairs, look at the Council of Europe training programmes. Um, there is a huge amount of training programmes there that you can actually get a huge amount of experience from. It's all covered financially, like you just go, you're not paid, but you're reimbursed. And I got a huge amount of experience there and I've been working with them ever since. So now I'm a consultant with the Council of Europe at the moment and um, in May 2021 I started working with the SRI, so the Economic and Social Research Institute, as a European Migration Officer, um, where we also 
it's kind of slightly different, so it's less kind of local level, but we work with national government and different NGOs, for example, on policy and, and research, and we, that feeds into the European Commission um, policy decisions as well. So it's, it's another way of, I suppose, um, trying to link up different levels of policy making, different levels of decision making, and things like that. So that's a very quick whistle tour. I don't know if I've gone over time. I don't know if I've made sense, but that's the kind of things that I've been doing over the last few years. I skipped over certain things that I don't find so interesting, um, or at least for me, but maybe they were. Um, but that's the type of things so I was doing. So I suppose for me to sum up the thing I would think about, I had no idea I'd end up here. I would have loved to know I would have been here. Um, and in the kind of career trajectory I am, but I think staying adaptable was key and kind of trusting what you're gut is telling you if you like at one point I didn't mention it but I worked in a bank for a year it was not for me it was a great experience but it wasn't for me and I remember thinking I could be here in 10 years time very comfortable very happy with life but I missed that flame and it's the flame that for me was something to search and I think when you're working in any way to do European there's a lot of travel often so it's um something that if you feel the flame kind of follow it and trust your gut a little bit um that's what I say you feel the flame follow it that's very nice <laughs> tell us a little bit. No, it is very nice. Uh, and I can identify with that as well. Mm. You mentioned Erasmus Mundi. Mundus, tell us a little yeah. bit about that. So the Erasmus Mundus programme, it's a European Mundus. Commission funded programme, uh, master's level. So when I say Erasmus, a lot of people, oh, you're on Erasmus. It's, it's a great party year. And I'm like, no, no, there's actually a master's and it's genuinely a lot of work. And I'm not saying the Erasmus isn't either. Um, but it's a two year uh, funded programme that runs, I know there's one based in Dublin, I think. It's the NOHA. Um, and it's humanitarian kind of, action type one but there's a lot of them across Europe and they're very interesting and they go in a lot of different areas and they're funded as well which I think is huge yeah. help yeah. Is, is, it the, is it a part of Erasmus Plus or is it a part of yeah. Erasmus Plus? Yeah it was it was Great. yeah a part of Erasmus Plus. There's also there's a club in water for years ago called Access Mundi if no. you remember you made me think of it. Oh. Okay <laughs> Erasmus Mundus is that it? Mundus M-U-N-D-U-S. Okay. I'll certainly look into yeah. that thank you we'll come back uh, Amy in a yep. little while but really interesting career and lovely to hear about it. Anya why don't you tell us about your own career trajectory? Thanks very much, um, and thanks, Amy. That's a really interesting story to try and follow, so I probably won't do it justice. Oh, no, sure. But um, um, so, yeah, hi guys. Um, so my name is Anya. Um, I'm currently working in the Department of Finance, but in terms of my own journey, started off studying history and politics, um, which and I was kind of one of those lucky people who kind of always knew what I wanted to do in college. That was easy. I knew what I was interested in. Um, then came out of my undergrad and was kind of like, oh god, jobs. I have no clue. Um, so after the undergrad, I took a year out, moved back to Galway, where I'm from, and just kind of thinking about masters. And um, spent a year working for AIB. Again, not with the intention of coming to the Department of Finance many years later. Um, and I suppose my, my interest in history and politics had kind of coalesced into a particular interest in Northern Ireland and the history of Northern Ireland. So chose to do a master's in conflict studies in LSE. So moved to London, did the master's again. Really enjoyed it. Really, really interesting. But a year later, found myself back in Ireland still none the wiser really about my career and really what I wanted to do. Um, so I just started applying for jobs. I kind of had a vague idea about the public sector that was about as specific as it got. So I started applying to different kind of public sector organisations, think tanks, um, including a role as a graduate policy officer in the Irish Embassy in London, which I was successful in getting. So I found myself moving back to London, all set this time to, I suppose, live my best life as a working adult and not an impoverished student. But this was 2020, and the world had other things in plan for all of us. Um, so I think I ended up working for the MC for a year, but I worked in it for about six weeks, um, and they sent us all home <laughs> because of COVID. But despite that, it was a fantastic experience. Um, I was working on the press political team there, um, so the majority of the work was basically parliamentary reporting, kind of reviewing different debates in the Commons, the Lords, and various committees, and kind of preparing reports on them. So for a politics nerd like me, dream come true, getting paid to, to watch politics. Um, but I suppose setting aside the, the fun and the interesting things I did, um, from a career perspective, the real benefit of that experience for me was the insight it gave me to the broader civil service. Because um, I'd applied, when I'd been applying for all those jobs, kind of after the masters, I had applied to an AO competition, but really at the time felt I was applying in the dark, didn't know what it would entail, if it was something I was even interested in. Um, and that year in the embassy, it gave me that insight. It made me realise, and while the work of an embassy differs in plenty of ways to the work of a, of a government department, a lot of the processes and the tasks are still the same. Um, so I finally got a sense for what the civil service might entail and that I might actually enjoy it. Um, and I think that was kind of just a huge benefit for me because I really think, based on my experience, the best thing you can do to prepare yourself for any kind of job application is to know as much as you can about the role. Um, 
So I think if there's one thing I really wish I'd known when I left college, it was would be the value of reaching out to people. Whatever sector you want, you think you might want to work in, whatever role, reach out and ask people who are working there already about it. Um, I said it was something, I didn't learn the value of it until coming to the end of my time in the embassy. And they were getting ready to recruit the next cohort of policy officers. And next thing I get all these messages on LinkedIn from people who were like, oh, I see you're currently a policy officer. They're advertising for new roles. I'd like to apply. Can you tell me a bit about the job? And this took me totally by surprise. I thought, oh my god, what a great idea to reach out to people over LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, so um, and I found the same thing has happened since I've transitioned across to finance again. Occasionally, you get people asking, you know, can you tell me a bit about the work of the department or what the work of an AO entails? So it's something I really, really encourage, um, irrespective of the kind of sector you want to work in, reach out, ask people, um, because nine times out of ten, people are more than willing to talk, and it helps you, I think. A, prepare, but B, also just get a sense of if you do want to work in this organisation um, or this role. Um, and I said, it's a lesson I learned quite late on. Um, but, and that's also what I got that at embassy. I got the benefit from the embassy of being able to, to meet civil servants that way and talk to people who had worked in other departments um, back in Ireland and, and gave me, again, this sense that I was like, oh, this is something I, I think I would like. Because um, I had applied in 2019, as I said, but didn't get past the first kind of stage of online assessments. So... Uh, and I'd kind of given up on the civil service idea at the age of 24. But this kind of refueled my interest in it, and I thought, yeah, this is something for me. So I was all set to reapply um, when the next competition came around. As it turns out, the original competition I'd applied for decided a year later that they were going to recruit more people from there. So they then, at that point, got to me in the list. Uh, so I was invited back to interview in late 2020 and was appointed to the Financial Services Division in the Department of Finance in February 2021. So it means I've been there a little over two years, which is hard to believe because it's flown. Um, but I think that's largely due to just the pace and the variety of the work, which has taken me by surprise, but it's definitely been the biggest positive without a doubt. Um, so as an AO, the work is kind of very much policy focused. So it means you can find yourself doing anything from, you know, preparing a submission for a minister, uh, drafting speeches, press releases, working on legislation, um, all things I've had the kind of, I've been able to have the opportunity to, to do. There's also a strong international element um, and plenty of opportunities for international experience, whether that's traveling to Brussels to attend EU negotiations and legislation, up to being sent as a representative from the department to different international organizations like the OECD, the World Bank. Um, so plenty of international exposure as well, which is another added benefit. Um, so I suppose after two years, I can hand on heart say there is no typical day in the civil service. Um, and while that's been the best thing for me without a, without a shadow of a doubt now that I'm in it, I think it's on the flip side, that is a real challenge when you're again on the outside looking in, trying to decide if it's something for you. So again, particularly for something like the civil service, I'd encourage you to reach out. Um, I think there's about 40,000 of us working in different departments, so no shortage of people to, to reach out to. And I suppose just the last thing, like look, kind of reflecting on my career path so far, um, the other kind of main takeaway I'd have um, would be to never undervalue any experience, be that professional or academic, that you've had up to this point, um, and not to not to cut yourself off from opportunities, particularly at this stage in your career, because you think you don't have the qualifications or you don't have the background. Um, like in my case, I'm working in the Department of Finance, but my history and politics degree equipped me quite well for a lot of the work. You know, things like policy analysis, um, which is kind of the bread and butter of a lot of our work. The critical thinking aspect of college very much prepared me for that. Similarly. I used to worry that a lot of my work experience really wouldn't equip me at all for any of the roles I'd like in the future. So like things like working for AIB. I also worked briefly for Tusla um, for a while after my master's, and I kind of thought, oh, God, I've, I've no relevant work experience for the sectors I want to work in. Um, but I didn't appreciate that at the time. I learned a lot of really good skills in those jobs from like just working under time pressure to meet deadlines, um, handling sensitive confidential data, um, attention to detail. All those things that are key across most workplaces, um, and especially the civil service. Um, and in terms of the civil service, I won't go into the weeds of the application process because it's late and I don't want to put anyone to sleep. But if anyone has any questions about it, very happy to, to discuss it later. But essentially, the interviews are competency-based. So each grade in the civil service has a set of core competencies, basically key skills. Um, and in, for an AO, you're looking at things like leadership potential, delivery of results, interpersonal and communication skills. Things you can glean from loads of different work uh, backgrounds and experiences. You might hone them and apply them a bit differently in the civil service, but you can start developing them now. Um, so I'd say don't, in my, in my experience, don't say no to an opportunity 
because you think it mightn't be the perfect fit right now for what you eventually want to do because you're constantly learning um, in any work environment. Um, so I say don't undervalue any experience you've had and don't limit your horizons. Don't shut yourself off to a, an opportunity at this stage because you think you don't, might, mightn't have the qualifications, especially something like the civil service, which really does have something for everyone. Um, so yeah, hope that was helpful. And uh, if you have any questions later on, I'm very happy to, to answer them. Gurmila, Anya, there was, there was two things occurring to me, both of which you actually managed to address in the last <laughs> minute. Was, it's really good. So just on, on a practical, first of all, you said about being a, you're trained as a historian. Mm, yeah. And the fact that as a social scientist, I'm always going on about that, that the skills you acquire as a historian or as a social scientist, it can lend itself to loads of jobs. Absolutely. So hopefully yeah. that comes as, as, as good news to people. And it's true as well. The, the ability to be able to draft a coherent paragraph, believe it or not, you know, that's a, that's a real value in a lot of workplaces and it doesn't necessarily come with with, uh, with, with a lot of applicants. Um, the other thing, um, just really briefly, the, the application process for AO for administrative officer, right? It's, it's a staged process, isn't yeah, it? Yes, so basically, usually they're general competitions. Now, there's sometimes there are specialist streams, so just be aware if they might be looking for people with a HR, finance, legal, economic background. Generally, they're general open competitions run by the Public Appointment Service. So you apply online. First round tends to be a series of online tests, things like numerical reasoning and verbal reasoning. Mm -hmm. and, deductive logical thinking, which is basically kind of a screening thing. Um, once you get past that, then it's usually an interview, a combination of an interview, which is kind of based on those core competencies, um, and a presentation exercise as well for AO usually. Um, that has changed a bit since I did it, I know, because I kind of did it during COVID, and it was a bit, so it was a bit strange, but I think as far as I know now, you, you, you're given material, maybe a proposal or something, you're given about a week usually to work on it, and then you have to make a presentation um, on some sort of cool. policy issue. So yeah, that's essentially. Very cool. So if anyone's step. thinking of such a job, uh, grab Anya after. Uh, thank you, Anya. So to Kevin, I wonder if your application process is in any way similar. I don't know if you want to mention that, but please, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, I mean, I can. I might mention that a little later. For sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so yeah, my name is Kevin. I work for currently work for the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, I guess probably the first thing to say is um, there was nothing especially kind of obvious about my ending up in my current role. Um, if I compare it to, let's say, a lot of the people who might be in my workplace, I'm not a dual national. I didn't grow up in multiple different countries when I was younger. I don't speak multiple languages. In fact, I, I have English, a tiny bit of Irish, and possible a best French. Um, I don't have any family members in diplomacy, in foreign affairs, in any sort of international organization. To be honest, the first time I ever stepped into the Department of Foreign Affairs building was my first day working there. Um, and I suppose the other thing to say before I kind of go through a bit of my career path is, I guess, just because of, I got certain positions or whatever, um, or I ended up in the current role I'm in now, doesn't mean that I did everything right. In fact, it means I almost certainly did some things wrong. Um, and it doesn't mean that I didn't make mistakes, miss opportunities along the way, et cetera. In fact, I was thinking of what you said there, Barry, about kind of the different roles you worked in the amount of times you've changed jobs. Um, it got me thinking, I'm currently in my fifth different role since graduating from my bachelor's, and I'm only 26, <laughs> despite the hairline. Um, so, don't laugh. <laughs> so, so yeah, don't worry, you're not, if you find your ideal job out, straight out of college, that's, I'd say, almost miraculous nowadays. Um, I mean, when I was in school, I think the first job I wanted to do was to become a teacher. Then I wanted to do something to do with maths. Then it was something to do with medicine. And then I eventually stumbled upon actually possibly the same degree you did, history and politics, history and political science. Yeah. Um, mostly because I had a really, really good history teacher. So I was like, okay, I want to do something to do with history. And I loved reading history books, et cetera. And then I kind of went, maybe I need an aspect, something to add on to that that's got a bit more relevance to a job market. Um, and the things I liked in history tended to be stuff to do with wars, kind of more contemporary history, et cetera. So I kind of thought, well, political science would be a good addition. The degree was a very good degree. It was quite broad, I found. I didn't try to specialize necessarily in one particular bit of history, one particular bit of politics. I also didn't have to do a thesis, um, because there was a weird loophole if you stay as a joint major, so therefore I avoided doing a thesis. Um, Where did you do it? Uh, Trinity College Dublin, yeah. Um, and then I was kind of finishing up my degree, and I didn't really know. I knew I wanted to do a master's, but I didn't really know where or what in. Um, so I kind of thought about it a bit and talked about my parents and decided it would make more sense to try and get a bit more experience of the working world, uh, both to know what masters I would want to do and then to know what I would want to do after that. So I spent most of that summer 2018 applying for, I think, 40 plus internships. I can genuinely say I have no idea, I lost count. Uh, but then eventually I 
on an internship with UNICEF's Brussels office, uh, so working with the EU institutions. So I was working on a mixture sort of grant management, so the programs that the EU are funding in different country offices throughout the world, helping to manage those in, within, in the Brussels office, and then also a certain amount of policy affairs. Um, so I did that for six months, and then I moved into a consultancy role in the same office, basically doing what I did before, but instead of getting a stipend, actually getting paid, which was nice. Um, so I was in, there in total for a year. It kind of gave me a great insight into the working world, uh, into how a big UN body works, into how the EU works, which has proved useful in most of the things I've done since, actually. Um, and then also, I guess, the sort of the world of humanitarian affairs and the world of development cooperation. So then I, well, I did my master's in Leiden University in the Netherlands. I very much had in my head, I don't know, I'm guessing most of you guys are probably finishing your bachelor's, kind of that sort of period, 2021, 20, 22, maybe a few older, maybe a couple younger. Um, but I guess I had in my head that I didn't necessarily want to do, the, do a bachelor's and a master's in the same country, possibly in the same university with the same lecturers in the same uh, like tutorial rooms that I had done my uh, bachelor's in. So I kind of looked a bit more further afield. A friend of mine did a master's in Leiden the year before um, in international relations, and he kind of advised me to look at it. So I applied and I got a master's, which was in international relations, focusing on global conflict in the modern era. Um, I had a really good time there. I would really encourage people to look outside Ireland for master's degrees, especially when you consider that I think it was cheaper for me to do my master's in the Netherlands and live in the Netherlands than to do my master's in Ireland, in Dublin, and live at home. Um, so when you put it that way, and also I didn't have to live at home with my parents, so that's a plus. Um, then as I finished my master's, COVID hits um, in the last few months of it, so I finished essentially online. And then like a lot of people when they finished their master's and a lot of people during COVID, I was um, unemployed, or as I put it, self-unemployed for, uh, <laughs> for about eight months. So I did, I did, so I was constantly applying for jobs during that period. Um, the advice I would give is, Obviously, there's things like don't be disheartened, et cetera. But very much, especially if it's kind of quite a bit of a period, don't kind of get into a situation where you're just firing out the same application, same application, same application. Um, look at loads of different options, but then kind of go, okay, these are the one, two, whatever things I'm going to apply for today. Keep a spreadsheet of the things you're applying for um, with the with, or the ones you're thinking about, uh, including the dates, um, the dates that you have to apply by. Also try and sometimes if you can download the details because sometimes the, let's say the web page or whatever uh, will disappear. And it happened to me for one role that I applied for it that then I had to email when I was offered an interview me like, so can you send me on all the information about it please? Uh, I didn't get it as it happens, but hopefully not because of that. Uh, then eventually I uh, got the uh, traineeship with the European Commission, what are called the Blue Book traineeships. Um, you may have heard about them a little bit. There's about 700 traineeships twice a year with the European Commission in the different directorate generals. Uh, mine ended up being quite close to what I was doing previously. So it was in the directorate general DG ECHO for humanitarian affairs. I was working on um, Syria, helping to organize the Syria Brussels conference, which is this big fundraising um, conference for humanitarian aid for Syria. I was in, in a sense doing quite a bit of grant management, doing what I'd done in UNICEF, but on the other side of it. So assessing the things that came in from different organizations, including UN organizations, not UNICEF though, because I still knew the people who worked there, um, instead of being the person who was kind of reviewing them before they were being submitted. So I was there for five months and applying away for various different roles, kind of had in my head that I would probably stay in Brussels, certainly in the short term. In the meantime, before that, when I was self-unemployed, I had actually applied for the Department of Foreign Affairs for the positions of third secretary. Um, got through the first two rounds, a bit like the Ministry of Officer applications, there's a, there is um, a set of aptitude tests, deductive logical reasoning, uh, verbal reasoning, et cetera, et cetera. Got through that round, got through a video interview round, which is quite, basically you were given three questions a week in advance, and then you had a time slot in which you had to um, say the questions to a camera being recorded. It's one of the weirdest things I've ever had to do for any job application. Um, but I did that, got through that stage. Then the third stage was a written exercise. I managed to pass that stage, but not within especially uh, high marks, so basically they were like, you passed, but we're not calling you for interview now. And I kind of assumed, right, well that's, because I, I think I, they have an order of merit um, telling you what place you are, and I was, let's put it this way, in the hundreds. Um, so I was kind of like, right, well, never mind. Um, so that was kind of in the back of my, wasn't even in the back of my mind, I'd forgotten about it. But then I applied for a role with the Irish Mission to the United, to the United Nations in New York. 
um, as a, essentially a policy officer, temporary policy officer, to work on the UN General Assembly covering the period of August to December to, uh, 2021. I was fortunate enough to get the role and moved over to New York. And it, I can honestly say it was one of the most exciting, probably including my current job, although I won't say that to my uh, colleagues, probably the most exciting, most stimulating, most interesting job I've had. Um, I would really recommend if when those opportunities come up again, which the applications tend to be around May, June, to work from August to December, working on the UN General Assembly, to take on six, seven, eight, nine people a year. You're assigned to different committees. Uh, the committee I was working on was the third committee, which focuses on human rights. Um, so I was working on things like the situation of human rights in Syria, the situation of human rights in Iran. Um, it, because we were on the UN Security Council at the time, even though I wasn't really working on those files, which kind of felt a bit odd. It kind of felt like you were allowed into a theme park, but you couldn't go on the rides. Uh, you couldn't do the really exciting things. But it meant that I and all the rest of us were given a lot of autonomy and responsibility in the things we were doing. So we were actually sitting in negotiations with other EU countries. Again, the knowledge I had from the, of working with the EU came of use. I actually see Leanne back there nodding. She was working for the EU delegation at the time. Um, and I was sitting in these intra-EU negotiations on various different bits of language from different resolutions. And then also, depending on the resolution, also in negotiations with the other 193 countries. Uh, not saying things off the top of my head, I can assure you. Um, every evening, you were getting email after email of latest drafts of resolutions and sending them back to the Department of Foreign Affairs headquarters in Dublin, um, saying, OK, so this is what the changes are. These are the particular things to note. Um, tell me what Ireland's position should be on this in like 12 hours time, I need to go to sleep. Um, I was, would have worked, it was probably the hardest I've ever worked in any role. For about an eight to 10 week period, I was probably doing between 60 and 70 hours a week. Um, basically eight to 10, 11 hours in the office, home, uh, dinner, watch a show, then three, four more hours when you, the new drafts of resolutions coming in, sending them back, sending them back. And then having to do a bit on the Sunday as well when new drafts were coming in. So it was very hard work, but it was incredibly enjoyable and incredibly fulfilling. Then another role I'd applied for, which was to work as an intern in the Department of Foreign Affairs. I applied for that in mid-2021. Did an interview, came mid-ranked on the kind of panel order of merit. Again, kind of had half forgotten about it. Um, but I was, um, I, they eventually called me and said, would you like to yeah, come and work in this role, which is to work in the International Security Policy Unit, working on Afghanistan, actually succeeding Keelan, who's sitting over there. Um, and so I moved into that role just as I was finishing up in the mission over in New York. Worked on that for six months. The biggest thing I worked on was the renewal of the UN, uh, UN mission in Afghanistan, working on the renewal of its mandate. So this was six, months af six seven months after the Taliban's takeover. Um, so the, the mandate had to be substantially rewritten. Norway were the country that were leading on it over at the UN Security Council. Um, and our diplomats there were trying to affect the language however they could making sure there was language in there about women, peace, and security, this kind of thing. So the draft resolution would come back to Dublin. I would essentially have to send it out to like different units, human rights unit, conflict resolution unit, humanitarian unit, while also reviewing it from sort of the point of view of the Afghanistan country desk. But, oh, yeah, OK. Um, so then I got a call um, asking me to interview for third secretary based on the competition I'd done ages ago. I interviewed for that in April last year, and I started in July. So the current role I work on is on EU common security and defense policy, which has become very topical as of the last 13 months. Um, working on two areas, one civilian CSDP, uh, which is essentially the EU's different missions in different countries doing various different tasks. They're helping train Coast Guard in Somalia. They're helping to investigate war crimes in Ukraine. They're helping to monitor ceasefire lines in Georgia and Armenia. So working on those man the mandates when they come for renewal in Brussels, helping to give our diplomats instructions about what to do on those. Then the other aspect is the European Peace Facility, um, which is used to fund lethal and, in Ireland's case, non-lethal aid for Ukraine. Um, I feel like I've kind of just gone through the career and kind of skipped any of the advice section. Um, we that in that case, I'll leave it there. Good. Just I want to allow yes. time for those important questions. And last but not least, Luke Callan White. Well, thanks, Barry, and, and thanks for the invitation to, to be back. And as Barry mentioned, I was here, it feels, not too long ago where I spent... Uh, um, three and a half years working at the Institute. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm now working at uh, Friends of Europe, which is a think tank in Brussels. Uh, my work focuses on climate change and energy primarily. Um, when I was 17, filling out my CAO, I had no idea that I'd be, be doing this. And just to kind of piggyback on some of the things that the other members of the panel have said, that it's really 
a kind of potluck at some time when you're 17, 18, and you're making a decision about what your undergraduate is going to be in, uh, it's not going to define the work that you can do. Um, a lot of the skills that you're learning, that you're, uh, that you're deepening and that you're honing are going to be applicable regardless of the work that you do. Um, very briefly, just about my personal journey to, to, to where I am now, I was always, always interested in the world, always had this, um, I, I studied geography and political science uh, at Trinity as well, uh, and I think my motivating question was, you know, how is power exercise and how do we, how do we organize states and how do we institutionalize cooperation? These kind of lofty ideas that were gearing me towards these subjects and really enjoyed my time at Trinity, not going to lead me to, to, to a job immediately, primarily because I wasn't thinking in that way. Um, when I was in my final year of undergraduate, um, I, I began working as a research assistant with a lecturer of mine. I am certain at the time I pawned it off as though I had been uh, asked to come join him in this research project, but I, I asked him. And I would really just echo what Anya said, is, is you know, reach out to people. Nothing wagered, nothing gained. And uh, I'm certainly happy to speak to anybody after the, the session here about uh, ways you can go about asking people for, for advice or tips or, or even just to propose an idea of your own. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're not going to get back to you. Um, when I finished my undergraduate, I worked for just over a year and a bit in a, in a restaurant in Dublin. Um, I think so many of the skills that I picked up there in the service industry work right now. Or I apply them in the work that I do. Um, so I would say if you're, if you're thinking about the next step or what to do, Certainly don't think that you're, uh, you know, you should be focusing only on the next position at this institution or at this department. There's nothing whatsoever wrong with, with um, working while you're making a decision about the next step. And as I said, so many valuable lessons that I've uh, learned and still apply uh, um, from my time there. When I kind of saved up enough, I went to the University of Toronto. Um, where I did a, a master's in, in, in political science, which was my area of focus. And the work that I had done with, uh, as a research assistant was on the, the politics of climate change in the United States. So that was a really the origin of where my interest in, uh, in climate change emerged. And um, um, so I spent a, a year working, uh, doing master's at the University of Toronto. I stayed on in Toronto to work at a, at a think tank there. Um, uh, focused on Canadian foreign policy. At the time, it had been over 11 years since Canada had a, a UN peacekeeping mission, and there was a lot of pressure to, uh, to change that with the Trudeau government. So uh, we were working on that, on that file. Um, when I moved back to Dublin, I did a little, abor little bit of work with um, some MEP candidates um, around the time of the 2019 election uh, on the question of, of carbon tax and climate change. That was the first a uh, real professional foot into to the question of, 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 of climate and energy. Um, I applied for the IIA um, uh, when I was uh, in January of 2019, didn't get it. And I would also say that it, all the applications that you send, you're going to get so many rejections and it's really, really hard to not take them personally. It took me a long time to, uh, to kind of divorce myself from the process. And one of the key takeaways that I have from the time working at a few different think tanks is, is it is a real skill to be able to detach yourself from the writing that you're doing, which was always felt very personal to me, and from the process itself, because ultimately you're far more than the work that you're doing. Um, but it was difficult because I, I really wanted this job at the IAEA, didn't get it. Um, so in June of that year, after having done some work before the, uh, with the European elections, I did start at the Institute, and as I said at the beginning, I, I was there for three and a half years. Um, I now work at, at Friends of Europe. Um, it's great to be able to, to we work very closely with the uh, International Energy Agency and with the European Commission, um, focusing on, on some core elements of the European Green Deal. Um, and I'm really lucky and fortunate to be able to do something that I feel passionate about and that I'm really interested in. Um, one of the greatest pieces of advice that I got was from a uh, professor of mine at the University of Toronto. Um, who said, it is not enough to just be interested in something to pursue it. Um, hobbies are interesting. And I thought that was, you know, people were quite downcast when he had said this, and what was this really applying to, or what did he actually mean when he said this? But it, it gave a sense to a lot of us, many in the class who were planning on doing a PhD immediately, um, the realization that, uh, as you know, Amy, it's such a large undertaking, and that um, it might seem like a great idea for the moment, but when you're thinking about long-term decisions like that, you need to have more than just interest in, in mind. And I thought that was a really helpful tip. And 
equally, and I'll finish on this note, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I find that a lot of the time when we're working, let's say, on, on new policy proposals or ideas that we're, we're trying to turn into written material or a blog or organizing a, an event or, or, or something of that nature, it is trite, but it is really helpful, I find, and with colleagues of ours to try and, and uh, think about the complete opposite side of the argument in your head. Completely familiarize yourself with the point that you find uh, to be antithetical to where you stand. And if you can argue that in your mind successfully, it'll become much, much easier to articulate it uh, either written down or, or, or uh, in speech. And I think that the most uh, incredible thing of the last few years working at think tanks, and the reason I would advocate for it for, for any of you here thinking about this, is that it's given me the opportunity to, to write more frequently. And that's something I really enjoy. Uh, and we all have different ways of expressing ourselves. But I find, and I think James Baldwin used to say that, you know, if you can, if you can write it, if you can describe it, you can overcome it. And that's as true for anything in your personal life as it is a really technical question about the Net Zero Industry Act that isn't quite clear in a commission document. So I think that if you're interested in, in, in writing, if you're interested in exchange of language, of ideas, of meeting international people with a variety of different perspectives, uh, I would say certainly embrace the idea of applying to a think tank. You're going to have lots of luck, but you're also going to have lots of rejections. Um, and it's OK if you have no idea where you're going to be in five years' time. Nobody does. Thanks a million, Luke. Keelan has a mic, and we're going to go to the audience in a sec. But just you did geography. Uh, anything from your geography training that was particularly useful in the career you ended up having thus far? Geography is is helpful. Um, it is. It is. Um, there is. There is an advantage certainly um, to having a background in geography. Um, it depends on what area of geography you focus in. I don't know if there are any geography students in the in the audience, but. Um, uh, it is helpful when you think about the Earth Systems was a, was a course that you, know, you could focus on in final year, and it's particularly relevant for, sure. for a job that focuses on climate change. And I guess you, you knew where Brussels was when you went to apply for your job. It probably helped. It did um, help, yeah. Does anyone have any questions for our very interesting panel? I've, I have questions uh, uh, plenty, but it's really for you guys. Anybody? While you are thinking then, can any of you comment on, you got me thinking about this, uh, Anya, anything from your, your private lives, not your private lives, but like from your, from your non-professional life, like sport or social or political experiences that you had that ended up standing to you when you were applying for a job, whether you were a sports person or, a, I don't know, involved in any kind of community activity of any kind? From my side, yeah, any? like I did volunteering the whole way up because I loved doing it and wanted to get different experiences so I think I wouldn't have gotten half the jobs I've gotten without it um, I remember at one time my now husband um, back in 2016 was like why are you doing all that voluntary work like you're not getting paid you should be what bad. sorts of stuff did you volunteer I did I worked in NGO like I say worked because I consider it like now it's my work but I um, you know English language teacher um, hmm. creative Art, it was like like anything that was particularly interesting to me across a range of series of things. It could be helping out at um, a bake sale, like any like anything. Like but um but at the time I ended up around twenty sixteen I was doing a lot of training, so I was a participant in training programs and then I became a trainer myself because I found it so interesting. So but it was all voluntary. And um, I was like, No, 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 it's interesting, it'll it'll lead to something. And um, but that voluntary work now, I'm now a consultant. I'm getting paid for it. So that's just one really obvious mm. one. You can it can you know you can work in that area. I know particularly in NGO sector, I think it's important. Um, yeah, it's just an example. I know from having applied for a lot of jobs, and like what Luke said, for every job I got, there was 10, 20 I didn't get. Yeah. Um, but I, I realise now from applying for things and also from being through many applications either to study or to or to work and you're making an assessment of someone's credibility as a candidate and their strengths and weaknesses but you're also whether they'll admit it or not you're wondering could I like spend time with this person I'm going to be in close proximity with this person working with them every day uh, does it look like does this candidate look like someone who's sound who's interesting and so like putting a bit of yourself into your cover letter you know if you have a real passion for for sport or for volunteering, or for writing, or whatever it is, 
all of these are very talented and you're going to be competing with hundreds of people who are very talented. So putting in little nuggets about whatever it is that makes you tick, I think can be really valuable. Anyone else? Like, I think that's a really interesting uh, part about Amy's volunteering experience, Anya, Kevin or Luke. Is there anything else you did outside of work that stood to you as a candidate for any of your jobs? I think in my case, um, it's not something I would have... I suppose I did a lot of um, public speaking, debating and that, um, mm -hmm. and it's not something, it's something I would have always put on CVs um, and mentioned in interviews, because again, I think the ability to speak in public is, is so important, but I think it helped me less, I think it helped me on the application form, but I think it helped me more when it came to interviews, because um, mm -hmm. I think I think it's, I think, most, I think interviews are often ways, because you know, they can be such an intimidating thing for people, and it's, it's hard, I mean, particularly the situation you described, Kevin, having to do that recorded, pre-recorded thing, that just sounds like a nightmare. I thought a Skype interview was bad, that's horrendous. Um, but you know, it could be such an off-putting experience for so many people, you're so nervous, you, you know, you've got limited time, so much to say. Um, I think a lot of the time, you can have very good qualified candidates who just might perform on the day in one interview, and that's it. Um, so I think anything you can do to increase your confidence um, at pre presenting and public speaking and um, for purely for interviews because they are essentially most, if not all, jobs involve them. And um, so I think it was still something I would have, I would have all included on my CVs and mentioned in applications. And I think it does look good, but I think just really just prepare yourself for interviews themselves. Yeah. Anything you can do to kind of increase your confidence that way is is helpful. Take deep breaths before you have to speak Absolutely, to yes. well. Just like when we're up here. Do you want to add anything, Kevin? And this is your opportunity if you want to share any of your... There is a question too from the back, but if you have any, anything to say, you, you say you couldn't get to some of the advice that you, took, you had in your notes, feel free to share it now. Um, well, just on the point about, I guess, thing, extracurricular things. So I also would have done a certain amount of debating public speaking and, yeah, very much that skill set of being comfortable speaking in public, but also... Um, especially a lot of debating I did, which was the concern debates uh, in the school. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if, mm -hmm. okay, so you're familiar with them. Um, but the fact you were given a subject that we can bit in advance, not necessarily getting the side of the argument you'd want. I'm pretty sure I had to argue that um, Romney should win the US presidential election in 2012, which even though I wasn't especially political at the time, I do think I had, I didn't quite agree with. Um, but the for yeah, as you say, they force you to take this opposite point of view to the one you have and examine the arguments and that kind of thing. And then the other thing would be, I guess, sports. I played Gaelic football and hurling for about 20 years. And it teaches you both, I think, in one sense, sort of the value of responsibility, personal responsibility towards a group, towards a team. Mm -hmm. Like, if you've got a hurling match on a Sunday and you go to have McDonald's on a Saturday evening or you go out for a couple of drinks, you don't play as well the next day, you're letting, the t you're letting a wider group down, you're letting the team down. And then a second way it really helped was um, when I moved to Brussels, I was on the hurling team over there. Um, the local expat team. And I met a lot of people through that who would have worked in European institutions, one or two who worked in the Irish uh, mission there, the Irish representation, and actually first gave me an insight into, oh, these sorts of jobs exist. Um, and one or two of those people had given, have given me advice on inter interviews subsequently. So that was quite useful. I think, I think that's a really, it's a good example. I'm, I'm betraying my own uh, kind of my own interests here, but someone with a background, be it debating or be it sport, or be it scouts or whatever, that someone who can, uh, somebody kind of takes responsibility for both themselves and for their group. I think that's mm. such, a, such a strong set of values or qualities to be able to convey in, a, in an interview setting. Luke, would you add it in? Um, yes, and I also agree with what other, other panelists have said. If you can make your CV stand out, just even in a small way, mm. it's going to help you. Um, include something quirky or, or off, but then somebody's going to read it, and 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 that's always uh, helpful. Two other things I'd just briefly add: it's it's never too late to learn a language. Um, I think that that's um, one of the most important Absolutely. extracurricular skills you can develop. Um, and also, brought this book along. This is a book called Designing Social Inquiry, and it's been one of the most formative oh, yeah. books that I've read. Uh, it looks quite dry. It is dry. Um, but I think that if you can take a, a, an evening course or find a way online to do a course in methods, yeah. uh, be it quantitative or qualitative, it's really going to stand to you, uh, regardless of the work that you end up doing. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's in high demand and short supply. And that's something when you're looking for your jobs, actually, it's, it's often it's something to be on the, on the lookout for, that if, if employers say there's uh, opportunities for you to develop and train, if you have a budget, uh, to pay for a course like a lot of good employers do. I guess the, you guys have access to training opportunities in the public service, right? Be it a language or something else? 
Uh, yeah, currently I'm doing classes at the Alliance Francaise, uh, as you say, to improve a language. It's never too late to start, or in my case, to pick it back up from eight years ago. Mm. Um, and it, thankfully, the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, supports it because it's, I guess, quite relevant. And Amy, you're literally doing an advanced degree whilst, uh, whilst working. Slightly so. more impressive. Yeah, it's good crack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, I started the PhD and then went for the job because it's also that sometimes the opportunity comes before you're ready for it. So the mm. job came and I was like, oh, that's the perfect job. I have to go for it. And everyone was like, you're not finished your PhD. And I was like, I don't care. Mm. And then I had a baby in between, which was great. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, you can, life as well happens. You know, that's the thing as well. Life happens. And if you see something, you know, jump for it. And as you said, like, I was constantly getting rejected for stuff and constantly going, oh, or being the worst rejection where you're so close, you get just there and then you're mm. just not, you just miss it. You're constantly missing it. And most of the key points, for example, for my, my master's program, the job I'm in now, I was second or I was on a waiting list. And like you're saying, it comes, it can't, not always, but sometimes it comes and it comes when you least respect it. So uh, yeah, but no, the extracurricular is always, um, mm -hmm. it's always helpful and it's always interesting as well for yourself. Thanks. This is only my second spring here. I forget how noisy the seagulls are this time of year. So I, I hope everyone is able to hear you. I think there are two brilliant questions. You can choose to answer between zero and two of them. I'll start with, uh, with you, Amy. Um, I don't think any of the risks I've taken haven't worked out because even if they've not worked out the way I thought they would, it, it's brought me to where I am now. Um, but I think there's a few key risks. Um, my master's actually saying I was working in a full-time very good permanent job with the bank and I was like oh come on I have the chance to like do it like it was yeah I was basically went back to being a student and had no money and it, and went to France and didn't speak French um so that was for me a risk I remember calling my mom about two days in and going what the hell am I after doing I'm sitting in this like no internet I've got like cockroaches everywhere it was like the worst student accommodation I was so sad didn't know where to buy food it was a Sunday and everything's closed in France on Sunday for me, it was like a low, um, but it was grand. Like there was other points. I was in Senegal. Like the, the we had a flood and there was mice and like I woke up with conjo. Anyway, all of the fun things happened, um, and I remember thinking, "What am I doing?" But it was the right cause. And if I hadn't made that risk, and th and then again the risk again, I finished the masters, thinking it was more employable than it was, and I couldn't get work. So there's, you know, I got work teaching, but then I was looking for something in where I wanted to be and it was mm. tough. So it took me a different way. And then vice versa, coming back to Ireland, I think was a risk for me. Um, so at the time I was set up in France. Um, my partner was over there. We had a life over there and then moving back, having to do distance with him. So there's also risks, I think, for career you do on a personal level also, you know, so there's, there's different risks that way. Um, and then him having to move over and it working out for him, you know, so there's, there's kind of risks can sometimes, professional risks can also have a massive impact in your personal life, so it's something to look at. But I do agree what you said, um, and I think I'm starting to see it in the last tw two years, I would say, 12 to 18 months, I'm now 33, um, but I found that the, the risks that I took when I could in my 20s, um, are finally starting, I'm starting to see the little, and it's, it, it goes from, you suddenly don't have any, you know, you suddenly think you're constantly struggling and, and, and reaching and thinking it'll get there, and then overnight sometimes it starts to get there. And it's not there yet for us, or for myself, my partner, or my family, but even career-wise, it starts to get there, and you go, oh, okay, I'm starting to reap a little bit. And that's, and it, and it will get there. If you, if, you, if you do the graft, it'll work there. And sometimes it won't, won't look like what you think. So, um, yeah, I think risk is, I think to do what, if, particularly if you want to do something that really gives you, um, as I said, the flame, yeah. the, um, it, is, it is worth taking the risks. So. Well, isn't it, we, is it we miss 100% of the chances we don't take? Or exactly, yeah. Worst case, it doesn't work out and you just go back to what you were doing before. Yep. Yeah. Uh, very well put. Um, I guess we'll, moving toward, towards a conclusion on you if, you, if you want to reflect on either of those Dara's questions regarding risk taking or indeed I think an equally pressing question how to encourage people into a life in public service. Yeah I think yeah, I'll go with the latter one. Um, but it's, um, I suppose the first thing I say is like there is a real sense of fulfillment in it um, and you know, I'm going to jump back to the emphasy here for a second just because I'll never forget why I really enjoyed that year when I was in my element getting to watch parliamentary debates and write about them and the mad things that were going on in UK politics at the time, um, with Brexit and everything. But I'll never, the most fulfilling moment I had in the entire embassy was the day uh, the manager said to me, listen, we're short staff, we need somebody to update this document. And it was a Q&A 
a kind of a post-Brexit Q&A for Irish citizens living in the UK and all the what the do's and the don'ts and what would change and what wouldn't change. And the sense of fulfillment doing something like that, we are like, actually really practical and going to help people. Um, was fantastic and I said that's something I've and while I'm obviously working in the Department of Finance not the area I said I study history and politics and they remain history very much remains my interest um, and my kind of my passion but I still get that sense of kind of that sense of I suppose fulfillment working in the Department of Finance and um, I really do every day and I suppose the added benefit then is I'm in the Department of Finance now but the opportunities within the civil service then to move whether that's internally within departments or between departments either on temporary secondment permanently with something like mobility, which allows you to transfer between departments. So, um, and that's something I was strong, again, I spoke earlier on about the variety of the work. And even if you do find something in the civil service that you're not interested in, the opportunities to move um, are, are fantastic. They're really, really good. So I'd say the kind of the variety and the opportunities to move, the, the kind of sense of a public service. And thirdly, I'd say it's actually, at the moment, it is quite a, it's becoming a much younger civil service. Um, mm. And the social side, which I think is as, is as important, to be honest, any job as, as, as the rest of it, um, I think that's it's been a real positive for me. Um, my first year was virtually all remote. Um, and I had a, and again, my team were great, and they really helped me to kind of acclimatize um, and get to know them all over Skype. But my second year, I, was kind of, I started going into the office around this time last year and it was honestly, it felt revolutionary to me. It felt like a new job because yeah. I was suddenly surrounded by people my own age um, and opportunities, like real simple things. But after two years of COVID, it felt so nice to have the opportunity to go for a coffee with someone and go for a drink. And, um, and I think that's only going to improve in the civil service over the coming years because we're coming out of COVID and we're also, again, it's such a, it's become a much younger service. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a really good social side to it as well, which I think would be also for me, it's the first time I've, worked anywhere really with a kind of surrounded by so many young people um, and that's been as good as anything else so yeah. We're, we're in that kind of phase ourselves here at the Institute where people coming back to the office more routinely and it is it's really nice just having, having people around hearing, hearing other people's voices. Kevin. I was going to say let Luke go because he's not last every time but I'll... No Luke can stay last it's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, so on the ri I'll answer the risk one very quickly even yeah, though I on. guess I don't really look like much of a risk taker dressed like this. Um, <laughs> So when I was 21, I did uh, an internship in an uh, unnamed major law firm here in Ireland. And on the back of the, that internship, I was offered a trainee contract. Uh, there's probably a few of you here who study law um, and possibly are looking at that route. So you get offered a trainee contract, you do a set of exams called the FE ones beforehand. Then while you're doing a trainee lawyer, you go to a place called Black Hole twice and do further studying there. And then you do a set of exams at the end and become a fully fledged sol solicitor. It's a very good career path. It's a lot of long hours. It's very, very well paid. Um, and I signed this pre-contract. I kind of had that on the back burner. And eventually, a year or two later, ironically, as I was finishing my master's and I was looking into a few months of unemployment, I made a decision to essentially give it up to uh, yeah, say thanks very much for the offer and for allowing me to extend it for a year as well. But I don't. that's not the career path I'm looking at at the moment. And there was once or twice when, about six months later, I was still applying for jobs where I did think, hmm. Um, but I'm really, really glad I made that decision, which in a year I was over in New York working at the United Nations, working the cra same sort of crazy hours that I would have done as a trainee solicitor here in Ireland, but doing something that I was passionate about, that was interesting, stimulating, that challenged me, as opposed to fundamentally something that I would have been I felt been quite bored doing. So going back to, I guess, the idea of was it having the flame for something? Um, yeah. Excellent. Very similar story I had. I, I also signed for an online major law, online major law firm in Dublin. And I remember going home. It was, I was finishing in the, my, I was in the, studying in UC at the time. And I was going home thinking I had to call my parents to explain I was giving up a life in law to read books for a living. Because I, uh, I went and did my graduate studies instead, and absolutely no looking back. Lots of happy lawyers as well, of course, but it, was, it wasn't for me either. Uh, Luke, what do you think? Risk or, well, just maybe focus on risk rather than the other question. I've taken lots of risks, and they don't always work out for me. Um, and I think that's OK. Um, and I think it's great, though, that you, know, you can recognize something that hasn't worked, but you can still deal with whatever the consequences of the decisions are. Um, in terms of actual risk, it's more of a, something to highlight, I think, that uh, making a decision to go to do a master's outside of Europe is, is something I don't regret, and I was really happy to do it. But in the European circle, it's very much a bubble, and so it, it can be quite cliquey, and oftentimes 
you know, you could be meeting colleagues or, or friends of the, any of the institutions that have come from the same colleges and a very similar path. So, the College of Europe? Mainly the College of Europe and LSE. But yeah. that's, um, that's, that's just, it is something to bear in mind if you have, in, you know, in your mind, you, you'd like to do a Blue Book traineeship or, or something of that sort. It, it, it is something to bear in mind because if you're in Canada or North, or North America more broadly, or even in the UK now, it will be harder to make that um, first step in. I think on the question of value that, that Dara asked and, and, and um, how to get people into, into public uh, sector work, a lot of young people, and I'd wager that most of you here, partly because you're here, are motivated to some extent by wanting value in the work that you're going to do. And it can be really demoralizing when, you're, when you have that way about you and you see that a job on LinkedIn requires, you know, might be perfect for you, requires three, four years work experience and immediately think, how am I going to get to a position where I can do this and also for to stay living in Dublin? It's so expensive and it's difficult and there are lots of really serious and somewhat existential challenges. Uh, as mentioned by Pamela, go for it, do it, submit the application. Um, I, I mean, if it's, if it's 15 years and you need to have three PhDs and you're at the stage now, okay, maybe that's not a great idea, but if, if you think you're within a window of possibility, definitely go for it. I think that what is really challenging for, for all of us, I think, in the room is that we're faced with so many existential challenges and I'm conscious that most of you were probably in school for some part during the COVID pandemic and it must seem like there's a lot of doom, a lot of kind of a really low ceiling in what can be done but that's not the case and working in in the area of, of, of climate change what part of what motivates me to work is the recognition that we have a huge amount of work to do and in the next few years, we know that the, the, the temperature increases for the next centuries will be determined by the actions taken this decade. And that can be overwhelming. And it's not to dismiss that, but it's to recognize that there's an opportunity with that urgency as well. And I think by virtue of being here, regardless of how it might seem that you, you know, these LinkedIn ads are, are targeting you but not reaching you where, where you are, go for it. You, you can contribute. Uh, to society. It might not work out in the path that you want and maybe some of those meanders are risks and maybe it will work out. Um, but I think being committed to an idea of, of working based on value is, is, a, is a good idea, it's a noble idea and if you, it's a passion of yours, continue with it. Um, so there are always going to be risks but there's still worth pushing through. Yeah, I've observed some of your most risky behaviour in, in the workplace, I can confirm. Um, I, have, I have one final question I'm going to put to the panellists, but I want to give you guys a chance in case anybody wants to say anything or ask anything. Plastic yourself there. Yeah, first of all, thanks everyone for the presentation. Really fascinating stuff and really heartening uh, work. Very interesting. Um, I guess as policymakers, my question is, have you ever come across situations where, say, I guess you have locked on hires up or even politicians in terms of got, got the politicians they think they know better with the policy making you know or is it always usually quite well received and how do you deal with those situations good question will you add anything else to that does anyone want to add thanks a million for your question what's your name eli eli thanks eli does anyone want to add anything to eli's question so you can start with luke and move back towards me so you can pass if you wish but luke do you have anything to say to eli it, it does happen uh and um I'll take externally, if you're having an issue with, let's say, a partner or another institution that happened not too long ago that we were, our organization was meeting with um, a major oil producer and we were letting them know that we're no longer partnering with them because we have a, a new um, a charter in our organization, which is that we don't work with uh, oil producers any longer. And they were irate and was not comfortable meeting to have. Uh, one of the best ways to, I think, to respond to that is, and it's a, it's a good tool for work in general, is just listen. Uh, listen to, to what they're saying, hear them out. You, you know, if they're you know, going to be trying to lock horns with you, probably not worth your while engaging, but you can still engage in a calm demeanor and you know, bring it back to the, the fundamentals of the point. Um, you don't need to involve yourself in ad hominem or hyperbole. Um, simpler is better, but hear them out. And I think that's a good general heuristic as well. We should all probably listen more, myself Excellent. included. Absolutely. Uh, I invite you each to respond. You don't have to, but Kevin, do you want to say anything? Uh, well, in terms of, do you say locking horns with ministers? Um, my job isn't that exciting. It, there's a lot more answering emails than there is uh, sitting briefing a minister in person at the moment. Um, but that'll come, right? Theoretically. Mm -hmm. um, no, it will. 
but in terms of this idea of yeah, of having a disagreement with someone higher up over an issue that you feel very strongly about. Um, it has happened once or twice, in, not in my current role, in previous roles. And um, I mean, what I did was I made the best argument for the point of view that I had based on what I knew about the facts of the situation, based on what I be believed that the organization I was in should be doing. Um, and unfortunately, ultimately, if your boss or your boss's boss still says no, there's, on, there's not really a lot you can do about that. But uh, having, from having talked through it with my boss, his boss, and from, I guess, kind of go back to you were talking about the background debating, public speaking, this kind of idea, or you were talking about as well about this idea of seeing the different points of view, even ones that are maybe antithetical to your own, I could understand the argument that this person was making, um, even if I didn't agree with it. So I guess I made my peace with it. Plus, they told me so. So, good. <laughs> On you. Yeah, I suppose similarly, um, as well, the thing with the civil service in particular is like obviously your role is to advise, obviously the civil service advises government, so mm -hmm. I suppose that's something to be aware of when you're going into, like the difference between being the civil service or being the politicians and the ultimate decision makers. Um, but I would say, yeah, I think like disagreements happen, um, happen all the time. I think the best thing you can do is give your account, um, you know, if you believe something, if you've done the research, if you've done the work, if you think this is your opinion, give it. Um, give it in a calm, measured, measured, we measured way. Um, and ultimately the decision isn't taken, then there's nothing you can do about it. But I think it's better. I, think I would always say, you know, if you really believe, have a strong view on something, don't hide it because someone is more senior than you. Um, you know, I would give your opinion, state it, you've researched it, you've done the work. If it, an alternative decision is taken, then you, could, you can still rest easy with that, you know. Um, but I think you, you would always regret not saying something, you know, just because someone's higher up or whatever, I would, I would never do that. I would, yeah, just say, give your opinion and ultimately then it's, You've done your best, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's never easy. It's never easy, but I do think actually you often get a bit of respect if yeah, you're, if you're yeah. a junior person if you assert yourself a bit. Yeah, the definitely. People yeah. as people at the end of the day, yeah. bring us yeah. home, Amy. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, how many of you have had like a part-time job, worked in the summer, um, dealt with awkward clients, in, yeah, in shops or in restaurants, or in, all of that is relevant experience to this because um, that's exactly the type of thing you could be dealing with. And, um, I've... It's all the people at the end of the day. Uh, D Dylan Ashland, is there still some snacks at the back of the room or have they been gone? Are they? Yeah, that's a good, great. Uh, you're all welcome to stay and to, to chat and interact and to, to share whatever is left at the bottom, back of the, of the room. But just to thank you all for your attention. But above all else, thank you very much to our panellists. I think it was excellent. I enjoyed it very much. I should just say as well, just thanks again to Evie McCullough and Sarah Burke for pulling the event together. Round of applause for the panellists, please.